So I brought some tennis rackets with me, as you can see, and uh, some of you know, some of you not, uh, I, I used to play tennis a lot for years, actually. Uh, I coached uh, for years as well. Uh, started with uh, kids that were like four years old and weren't taller than the, ten than the net, and that was interesting. And, uh, and then through, through the years, some different ages and stuff. And, and as someone who at the time was, was teaching, at, whether at church for, through the Bible and then also going on the court and, and playing tennis, uh, I started finding all sorts of parallels between tennis and, and our walk with God. And I just want to share one of those with you uh, as we get started today. We're going to be in, in Acts 14, verse 1. And uh, when I started playing, I was about 10 or 11 years old, and you won't really see the size of these rackets very different from back there necessarily, but they are different. Uh, when I started playing, I played with something like this. It wasn't it wasn't exactly like this. The little head was a little bit bigger. Um, so I'm going to give you a little tennis lesson here. Do you mind? Is that okay? Okay. Um, it was about, about this size, about 100 square inch head size, which is this racket right here. And the thing about this is it's nice to start with it because um, on, on, on tennis rackets, there's something called a sweet spot. And on this racket, basically the way you tell what that is is here's the neck and that V spot. You just come up to the center of the racket. And so the sweet spot on this racket is about this size. Um, then a smaller racket, this racket here, is a 95 square inch head size. So again, it's a little smaller. Sweet spot's right about here. And, and then there's uh, this racket here, and this is a 90. And uh, the sweet spot's even smaller on this. It's really just about the size of a tennis ball. So it's quite a bit smaller. And uh, of these three rackets, what do you think is the hardest one to play with? The smallest one. It makes sense. The sweet spot is the smallest. The thing with the sweet spot is, in order to hit it accurately every time, uh, it, it requires more work on your part. So, um, for example, let's say you're going to hit a forehand. You're going to come along, and in order to hit the ball in the sweet spot, which is like the size of the tennis ball, your footwork has to be a lot better. Your knees actually have to be bent. Your body has to be in the right position for the shot. Your swing has to be the right speed and timing. Everything has to be much more perfect, okay? And then you get a racket like the one I started with where I could come along and, and swing. My knees don't have to be in the right place. My feet don't necessarily have to be in the right place because the sweet spot's a lot bigger. And the nice thing about hitting it in the sweet spot is I feel like I can control the ball a lot better. If you hit it outside the sweet spot, um, if any of you have tried to play tennis and, and haven't, um, it hasn't worked out so well for you, um, and the, the ball goes shooting off in one direction or another direction, or you hit the ball and the racket kind of spins under your weight and goes backwards. Um, the reason is, is probably because you're not hitting it in the sweet spot. Uh, as I uh, kept playing, players would continue, as they got better and better, they stay playing with rackets that were like this one, that were 100 square inches, so the sweet spot's bigger. Um, as I uh, and I'm not saying that I'm better than anybody else in, in this regard. As I got um, better and kept playing, um, I kept wanting to play with smaller and smaller head sizes. And uh, this racket here is, um, if any of you are interested, it's called a BLX 61 Tour. And if you have heard of Roger Federer, this is the racket he played with for a very long time. Um, and I, I really like this racket. I like the way it feels, but it makes me play a lot better. Like, it, it forces me to be a lot better in order to play with this racket. Um, I have to have better footwork. I have to have everything in my body has to be better in order to use that racket. And when I, when I do use it and I'm doing the right thing, it feels great. Like, I mean, I can hit some great shots with that that I just can't hit with anything else. But as I'm playing with this racket, I get the question from others all the time who are using 100 square inch head sizes, for example. Wait, why do you play with that racket? It's so much harder to use. And my response to them is because it forces me to be better. It forces me not to be lazy. And um, I obviously parallel that then with our life as a Christian. Um, it's easy to use and to do the things that we did when we first started in our walk with God. Um, whether that be, you know, I showed up to church on Sunday and I'm doing great because I used to never go to church. So rather than 
growing closer to God and then improving your life and working harder and doing hard things, we like to stay where it's easy and comfortable. And oftentimes when we do that, we just stay lazy. And that, I'm going to leave these up here. So that just came to mind as I was preparing for this. So we're in Acts chapter 14. I'm going to reference those as we go through. Acts chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. Um, let's read that uh, together here. Uh, now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogues and spoke in such a way that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, some people with the Jews and some people with the apostles. When an attempt was made by the Gentiles and Jews with the rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for this time to get into your word, uh, to, to pour into this. Lord, I pray that you work in our hearts this morning. Uh, that you speak what is on your heart, Lord, not what's on mine. Lord, that this, um, this message is just penetrate our hearts this morning as your spirit works in us. In your name, amen. So, quite quick recap. Paul and Barnabas are going around. They're sharing the gospel. And... Um, they had just left Antioch, as Pastor Carl said last week, and the way they left, if you remember, they just got completely rejected. They took off their sandals, they shook the dust off their sandals, and they're like, we're done, we're leaving. And uh, it says in verse 51 of 13, but they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And so that's where we pick this up. Um, it says the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So... And this has already happened. They, they tend to go into a town, they go to the synagogue, and they preach the gospel, and then they get rejected. They get sent away, and then they do it again. And then they do it again. <laughs> and then after that, they do it again. And uh, the first thing I see from this that I pull out of this is don't always go where it's easy. So, look at, so Paul goes to the synagogue, and the reason he goes there is supposedly uh, to... Go to people who are initially, who are seeking God. I mean, you'd assume that when you go to the synagogue, these people are already, they realize that God's there, they're looking for God. So let's start there so we can tell them about Jesus. But as I said before, Paul already knew what the people were like in the synagogues, many of them. Because he was once a Jew, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, and so as a Pharisee, he knew what they would think of Jesus, of him proclaiming Jesus as the Savior. And so, why would Paul go somewhere where he knows he's not going to be completely accepted? I mean, like, for me, if I were to go into a place, I'd be like, now where are they not going to reject me? And that's where I'll go. Not the other way around. So, I get two lessons from this. So, why did Paul go there first? I think, one, he had a deep love for the Jews. I think he really authentically cared. It wasn't just a, a project for him. Like, he's like, I was one of them. I was lost just like them. And he realizes how serious they care, how much they care about God, but they don't know Jesus. And so, I think that was one reason he went there. But, I think he also wanted them to know the complete truth. He didn't just want them to know part of it. He wanted them to know everything. It wasn't just, you know, they know a little bit, they should be fine, if they keep searching, it'll be good. But he knew that they were going to reject him and push him away. But he cared that much for them that he still went there. And so that first point is, don't always go where it's easy. Sometimes in life you have to do things that are hard. Oftentimes, I find myself going where it's easy instead of where it's hard, because I don't like doing things that are hard. I don't like being pushed into uncomfortable places. But he, he knew it was going to be hard, and he didn't, he didn't give up. 
And oftentimes, the right thing is the hardest thing to do. I'm going to say that again. Oftentimes, the right thing is the hardest thing to do. And so as we go on through this morning, think about those things in your life maybe that, that you've been struggling with, that one thing's really hard so you don't want to do it or you haven't been doing it, and the other thing's easy and that's what you have been doing. And I think God's calling us to do hard things because oftentimes they're the right thing. So let's keep moving forward. Verse 2, but the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles. That wasn't anything new. And poisoned their minds against the brothers. So this, this word that says, but the unbelieving Jews. And you break this word unbelieving is really broken down to disobedient Jews. Because they were disobedient to the message of the gospel. When, God, when, when Jesus comes and he speaks truth, and you say, I'm not going to believe that, you're being disobedient to the truth. And then it says, what, what did they do to the Gentiles' minds? What does it say they did there? It says they poisoned. And this word poisoned is embittered or polluted or exasperated. Uh, kakou is, is the word actually what this means. And, and it's, they actually work to try to convince them not to believe the gospel. Okay, you catch that? So Paul and Barnabas come in, they say, here's the gospel. And the Jews who don't believe, not only were they like, you know what, let them believe what they're going to believe. They came along and they worked to make them not believe that. And that's this poisoning of the mind. And I, I think the people, the, the world does that too right now. They come alongside us and say, you know what, the church says this. Maybe the Bible says this. But is that really what you need to believe? Is that really the truth? And they started questioning these Gentiles and what they were saying. And, and I think that maybe they were good-willed. Maybe the Jews wanted them to believe the truth. Maybe they're like, you know what, for thousands of years, God has said this. Paul and Barnabas can't be telling the truth. How were they to know? How were the Jews to know? I mean kind of delve into the question of truth. What makes something true? I mean, why were the Jews wrong and Paul and Barnabas right? Anybody? Why were they right? I mean, what, the thing Paul and Barnabas believed, that was true for, I mean, the, the Jews believed was true for thousands of years. But then Paul and Barnabas show up and say, oh no, this is true. Jesus, he isn't just some guy who showed up. This is the Messiah. This is the guy you've been waiting for. The law has been completely fulfilled in Jesus. You now have freedom in Jesus. And the Jews are like, no, there's the law. We have to follow the law. They were basing their truth off thousands of years of rituals. And then Paul and Barnabas come along and say, um, something else is going on here. We live in a world that challenges truth all the time. All the time. And what's true for you not necessarily true for you. In some cases, um, some cases that's true. The case, for example, that it's true for me that I don't like mushrooms. Um, Josh knows this. Many times as he said, I can cook you a mushroom that just tastes, doesn't even taste like a mushroom. Like you won't even know. It still tastes like a mushroom to me. <laughs> I mean, he cooks great and stuff, but it still tastes like a mushroom to me. I don't like the texture. I don't like anything. So for me, mushrooms don't taste good. Now, some of you, who likes mushrooms here? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> a lot of people who... <laughs> um, but simply because you all like mushrooms doesn't mean that mushrooms are suddenly good for me. I still don't like mushrooms. Um, but... There's those kinds of truths, and that's called a subjective truth. And then there's the truth that Jesus came from heaven. He was born. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for your sins, and he rose again on the third day. And if you put your faith and trust in him, you can have eternal life. Now, is that truth a subjective truth or an objective truth? Truth that's no matter what you believe, that's the truth. It's called an objective truth. So regardless, that's what's true. And so Paul and Barnabas come in and say, yes, what you believe is the foundation for that, 
But Jesus came and he fulfilled that. All those cracks in the law there, I just imagine like, the, you got like the Ten Commandments, for example, like all stacked up. Jesus came along and he poured over all of those, not saying that those aren't good and those aren't true anymore, but he filled in all the gaps anymore on the Sermon on the Mount. When he's preaching there and says, you know, you all believed that that was wrong. Here's something else. You all believe that murdering someone, that's wrong. But I say, if you hate somebody, if, if your mind goes that far, it's just like doing that. And so what I feel like he's doing to me, because I work in pictures again, is he like poured over all that and said, you're just standing on this. I'm trying to get you the whole picture for you here. And the Jews didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to believe that what they believed was just a foundation and there was something more. And so when Paul and Barnabas walk in and start preaching the gospel, they're preaching Jesus Christ, the Jews come along and say, no, no, no. That is not true. And that's this idea of poisoning their minds. They were trying to convince them otherwise. And so they turn, as we see later, they turn physically to violence, but verbally here, they try to start ripping apart Paul and Barnabas. And so verse 3, let's keep moving forward. It says, uh, be persistent when things are tough. So it says, so they remain there, a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And so, look at, look at what it says. It says, so they remained there. So they remained there. And the first thing I want to hit on is just because there's opposition to what you're doing, if it's the right thing that you're doing, it doesn't mean you need to stop. Like, opposition does come in life. And just because you get opposition doesn't mean it's God saying, stop doing that. Okay? Because that, that, they, that, they could have said that. Paul and Barnabas could have been like, you know what? They don't want to hear. God must be telling us to not preach here. But that's not what they did. That's not what they did. This, this word because implies that it was because of their unbelief that they stayed and tried harder. They didn't back down, and they did not dampen down the message of Jesus. It was almost as if they were more inspired and spoke out even more boldly because of the opposition, rather than backing down. You see that? Like, it, it wasn't like they, they disagreed, so we're going to leave. It was they're disagreeing, like, they're not understanding the greatness of what we're saying here. They're not understanding what Jesus is really doing here, so we're going to stay here longer. Would you do that? I, honestly, for me, I mean, I've gone to a couple, other, I mean, a couple other countries and spoken, and it's nice when people receive you well, but if they were to jump up after pre sharing the gospel with them and start yelling at me and screaming at me, and, and later we see they start planning to kill me, I'd probably be like, <laughs> that would probably be my response. Um, but God was obviously making a statement here because he gave them the power to do signs and wonders to help them prove the validity of their message. And now that doesn't happen to all of us, and that doesn't mean the validity of our message is, is false or anything. But here it's even more so God came along and said, I'm going to give you the power to do this. And people hopefully will see that and trust in the validity that I really am speaking through you. Does that make sense? And so... They stand there, they speak boldly. We also see that God actually did this with Moses in Egypt. Moses is like, I'm going to go back to the Pharaoh, but why would he believe me? And God's like, well, you can do this. Throw your staff on the ground. Snake. <laughs> like, that happened. Or touch the water and see what happens. And I'm going to keep doing stuff to show Pharaoh and the people who don't believe that I really am working through you. Now, all of Egypt didn't believe. And we see here that all of the Jews didn't believe because of this. But God is still working have you seen a miracle before? Have you seen something that's just like physically, like on earth, like not possible? I, um, we, and I've shared this before, but I, when I went to when South Africa and we, there was mission, miracles and stuff that would happen there and people saw that and, and then we come, come to the close of the day and 
um, people would share all sorts of stories and stuff, and their faith would just be like crazy. I mean, they'd just be so excited and on fire. Um, and I'd be like, this is awesome. Like, that's so cool to see. And, and then years later, as I'm kind of staying in touch with some of them, they're not walking with God at all. Now, some of them are, yes, but there's many of them who are not at all. And I, I have to ask myself, how? Like, you see God work so powerfully. You see God changing people's lives, both on the inside and the outside, and yet you still walk away from that. I don't, I don't understand it. The power of God and the preaching of the gospel bring out the best in humanity, or can bring out the best in humanity, and it can bring out the worst. It can either unite people or it can divide people. That's what the gospel does. We've seen it for thousands of years. People have been united over it, and people have been divided over it. Let's move on to the next thing on that note. You may cause division, and not necessarily you personally, but the gospel, the word that you speak may cause division. And for me, it's the, that's one of the hardest things uh, to do. Uh, because growing up, I, I kind of always saw myself as the peacemaker at home. You, you know what I'm talking about? Like, maybe you were one of those people that um, your siblings are like, like cats fighting over here, and, and you're the person that comes along and goes like this. Don't do that. You know, maybe you were that person. Um, and there was sometimes that I, I felt like I was doing that because I just didn't like seeing conflict. And that's still true now, and I know that sometimes when you speak truth or when you speak what God wants you to say, you're going to cause people to not like you. You're going to cause division. Maybe it's between you and somebody else or division between two other people. But that happens sometimes when you speak and do what's right and what's true. And that shouldn't drive us away from doing what's right. Jesus also did that. First Peter 2, 8 says, Jesus was a stone of stumbling, a rock of defense, a rock of offense. I mean, Jesus, when he showed up and he started speaking, people's families, I mean, Jesus was like, you follow me and leave your father and your mother. I mean, Jesus was like, come, follow me, leave your jobs. I mean, people were separating from what they used to do all the time because of Jesus. Sometimes when you're doing the right thing and you have to say the right thing, people aren't going to like you. And for me, I feel like over time, um, God's helped me in that area. I'm nowhere there, but saying hard things to people and things that they don't want to hear and I know they don't want to hear and being in a place of being in disagreement with somebody. I've never liked that. I still don't like it. But sometimes you have to say, like, I care about you, I love you, but what you're doing is wrong, and so you're going to, and those actions are going to be over there, and I'm going to stay over here. I still, I still will associate with you, you know, or whatever, but I'm not going to take part in that. And I have to do what's right and say that that's not what God wants over here. But I'm still your friend. Now, that doesn't mean, I just have to reference this before we move forward, is it doesn't mean just bring up stuff that you don't like, okay? Because we all don't like certain things. Don't just bring it up and complain about it. And, and it goes actually even further that Paul talks about this many times. I'll read a couple things. In Romans chapter 16, 17, and 18, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord. But their own appetites, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. So don't be a part of that. In Titus 3.9, he says, avoid foolish controversies. Like, if it's not something that's grounded in the Word of God, if it's not something that you're holding this and saying, this says something and you're doing something different, you really got to weigh if it's worth bringing up. Like, there's some things you just don't have to cause controversy over. And there's some things that you have to stand true to what's right with. And, and maybe that means, as, as the apostles did in, also in Acts, that you have to go and just pray for boldness to do the right thing. Um, in Acts chapter 5, 29, Peter said, uh, we must obey God rather than men. We must do what God wants over what man wants. 
We'll just keep moving forward. Verses 5 and 6, it says, When an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and they fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia and to the surrounding county. And so they, they heard, oh, they're going to try to hurt, they're going to try to kill us, they're going to try to stone us, which was a, a common Jewish practice of, as far as killing people, um, and oftentimes for blasphemy as well. And so they're like, we're going to leave. And so they did. And like I said, I would too, I think. But were they wimping out? I mean, they left. But were they wimping out here? I would say no. And the reason is this. They left the location. They didn't leave their message. Okay? They left. And what did they do when they left? They kept preaching. And later they would go back again and keep preaching. So it's not like, you guys don't like to hear this, I'm leaving. It's they stayed, they worked, and they kept preaching. They kept teaching over and over again. And then finally they're like, we're just sick and tired of this, the Jews said. We're going to try to kill, we're going to kill you. It's like, all right, we're going to go over here and preach. So if your life is in danger, it's okay. <laughs> like, but don't leave the message. Don't, and if God tells you to stay, then stay. Do what God's called you to do. Do the hard thing if that's what God has called you to do. Also, the other thing I know that's interesting is, is notice what it says. Um, an attempt was made by who? Both the Gentiles and the Jews. They're enemies. <laughs> like, they generally don't work together. But I think it's one of those things that, uh, as the saying goes, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I think they may, that conversation may have happened there. They're like, you don't like what he's saying. We don't like it either. Let's team up and get them out of town. I feel like that's kind of what happened here. And so they did that. And it's interesting that um, when, that kind, when you see that kind of division occurring, in places, sometimes you see some incredible unions happening. And that happens with truth sometimes. It brings people together and it pushes people away. Um, let's move on to this last point here. It says, what, what did they continue to do? What did they continue to do? Preach the gospel. They did not stop. You all have heard the story of the, the turtle and the hare, right? Uh, his hair, it, it, they have this, this who, who can win in this race, and they start off, and the rabbit goes running down, and the turtle just keeps walking. And then, you know, the rabbit's like, what, halfway there or whatever, he turns back and he sees the hair, the, the rabbit way behind him, and he's like, I'm tired, that guy's way back there, I got time for a nap. And so he takes a nap there, and when he wakes up, it's obviously too late. Wakes up, looks in front of him, and he sees the turtle crossing the finish line. He realizes that he just lost the race. My point with that is, is, is look, what they, look what he did. He, the turtle kept going and going and going. It, if you all have seen a turtle walk, they don't do it too well. Like, I mean, they just, like, they just kind of plug along. And for many of us, again, connection here we think if we're not going somewhere really fast, it's not worth doing. That's not the case. Our walk with God isn't like lightning fast. You don't just start your race with, you know, Paul talks about this, this running this race. We, it's not a sprint, and then we get there, we're done. It's a marathon. And if any of you have run or, or done, run before, sometimes when you run, it's easy when you start. But like three miles in, you're like, ask Gary. You're like, okay, this is, this is tiring. Like, this is hard. And you start running up those hills, and you're like, why am I doing this to myself? Because it's hard, and it hurts. But when you finish, it's great. Like, at least for me, when I'm done, it feels great to be done. But there's moments in there that it just hurts to keep going. Some of you just don't run at all because you just don't like running, and that's fine. <laughs> All right, Josh is, um, but what keeps us, in closing, what keeps us from doing this? What keeps us from plugging along and doing the hard thing? And maybe that's preaching the gospel, maybe that's speaking out when you see 
things that are not right going on in life, whatever that may be, what is your hard thing? Because we all have one. I have one. We all have something that God's called us to do that's hard for us to do. One thing may be fear. I think fear is a big killer of, of preaching the gospel today. Maybe it's fear of rejection. Maybe it's fear of the unknown. Um, maybe it's fear of not having all the answers. Fear of saying the wrong thing. Fear of causing division. Maybe it's just fear of doing something that's hard because you just haven't done it before. I don't know. Um, but in Luke 9, 23 and 24, Jesus says this, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. Many times we can just come to church, hear a message, sing some songs, have some great worship, and then leave and not do anything else with it through the rest of the week. And God's like, I'm calling you to myself, and he's giving you whatever instructions those may be, but we just sit back and going, God, that's kind of hard. I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't I don't want to do that because it's going to require me to change this area of my life. I mean, maybe it's, I'm going to have to actually bend my knees, and maybe I'm going to have to lean over a little bit. Maybe I'm going to have to change my grip. Maybe that's going to be actually me watching the ball this time. Like, I haven't done all these things together, and maybe I've done one of them, but I, I mean, I've watched the ball, but I've never actually done it while I'm bending my knees. Like, I've never done all of this together because it's hard, and it takes work, and it takes practice. Whatever your excuse is, God's like, all right, but you're not going to get any better unless you do it all together. Your life's not going to change unless you actually do what I've asked you to do, unless you do what's hard. So what's God asking you to do? Maybe that's putting your faith and trust in Him completely in every area of your life today. Maybe that's what it is, because that's scary. Maybe it's, it's just handing over something that you've never actually given to God. Maybe that's handing that over to him, laying it at the foot of the cross, and saying, God, I'm done with that. Whatever it may be, do it today. Do it today. And I pray as the, as the worship team um, comes back up and, and leads us in our final song. Uh, Lord, thank you for your word. Speak for myself. It it is like a sword that drives into me, that cuts away those things that I don't like, that drives me to be someone that is, is better. Uh, Lord, I pray that your word has done that today to everyone listening. It's your word that changes lives, Lord. It's you that change lives. Help us hold on to that. In your name, amen.